So you spent your young adulthood drinking and brawling your way through every pub in Ireland until Yes Mistress here caught sight of you and turned you into a vampire. After that, the two of you spent a few centuries laughing, making merry, and killing whomever you felt like just for the hell of it. But one day you killed the wrong woman and pissed off these here Romani people and that's when things got a little hairy. They cursed you by restoring your soul, causing you to live with the guilt of all the evil you've done and having to live forever. It took you another century of personal anguish until you made your way to a small town called Sunnydale, where this young bonnie lass named Buffy showed you that life is still worth living. Close your eyes. I want my life to be with you. You decide that the time has come to seek personal redemption, so you break things off and make your way to Los Angeles, the city of angels, and start trying to make the world a better place by protecting innocent people from the kind of monsters that you used to be like. And that's the basics of what you need to know about Ah, uh, but there's still a lot more that I didn't even mention at all, but yeah, as you can probably tell, just the backstory alone makes it clear that the show Angel has a damn fertile premise, and boy oh boy does a beautiful, ambitious, and awe-inspiring five-season narrative bloom from that soil. The show starts off as a caper of the week where the small team of Angel Investigations would deal with whatever case they had on their hands then, and the monsters they encountered and the people they helped would reflect important qualities about the characters, usually either personality flaws or things that they need to overcome. But midway through the first season, it started to transition into a more introspective, character-driven show wherein longer, more serialized story arcs would show the group facing both larger threats as well as more personal problems in their lives, and they would seriously examine themselves as people as they make tougher and more morally dubious decisions in the name of what they feel is the right thing. In addition to its frequently changing aesthetics and style, the show also reinvents itself several times through the rotating ensemble cast that accompanies Angel through his many vampy shenanigans, including Sunnydale alumni like our Queen Cordelia, best character Wesley, and Spike, as well as new characters like Charles Gunn, Fred, and Lorne. But there's one character that is sometimes overlooked in analysis of the show, one who came along before many of the aforementioned characters, and while he does have a place in the hearts of most fans of the show, the brevity of his tenure within the main ensemble places him at a disadvantage when the time comes to dissect and examine the show's narrative themes, character arcs, and lasting legacy. But now, the time has come to change all that. I am going to set things right by dedicating an entire video essay to one small, hapless dude who only appeared in nine episodes of a five-season show. This is The Legacy of Doyle. Look, high school's over, bud. You gotta make with the grown-up talk now. Now that's a pretty loaded line there, huh? really emphasizes the challenges that Angel is going to face as he tries to start his own journey of doing good, his way, without Buffy. Buffy the Vampire Slayer is often said to be a show about growing up, and following that, Angel is then said to be a show about being an adult. So really, this line is saying that Angel is going to need to take the lead on what he decides to do, and that one of the first steps on his road to redemption is going to have to be establishing some solid connections with the human world. Enter Alan Francis Doyle. He's reminiscent of Whistler, Angel's previous guide to reconnecting with humanity, a good demon who has a penchant for telling Angel his own backstory, and pointing him to the first steps toward helping people. I'm not good with people. Well, that's the whole point of this little exercise, isn't it? What do you want from me? I want you to see something. However, that doesn't mean that Doyle is a one-to-one -one clone of Whistler, no matter how well he wears that fedora. For one, he's Irish. Hey, sort of like Angel. 
And he's not just a good demon, he's half man and half demon, sort of like Angel. And he too is trying to atone for the times he failed to help humanity, sort of like Angel. And, and, while Angel's struggle to avoid drinking human blood is used as a metaphor for recovering from alcoholism, Doyle himself also has a bit of a drinking problem. Wait, what? So this brings us to one of the most important storytelling tools in both shows. Self-recognition through the other. This term refers to the idea of us coming to understand ourselves better through our interactions with other people. In Buffy and Angel, this allows the characters to better understand themselves and gain new insights into their own beliefs, values, and identities. This concept is sort of the main thing of Buffy and Angel, and it's a pretty great narrative concept to use in any sort of supernatural fiction, because the interactions between human and supernatural characters can entail unique insights into human nature. One of the most notable examples of this concept is the relationship between Buffy and Spike. Spike goes back and forth quite a bit between being both an antagonistic force to Buffy and her closest confidant at several points, highlighting her own internal conflicts around her responsibility as the Slayer and her own morality. As a vampire, Spike embodies many of the qualities that Buffy despises — violence, impulsiveness, and supposedly a lack of empathy. He's also monster horny. I'll make it quick. It won't hurt a bit. However, through their interactions, Buffy gains a deeper understanding of herself and her own inner demons, as well as a more nuanced understanding of the complexity of morality and the nature of evil. In Season 5, Buffy coldly tells Spike, You're beneath me. But by Season 7, Buffy is Spike's strongest advocate, even defending him against Giles. Throughout the first nine episodes, this is the kind of dichotomy that Angel and Doyle have. Angel observes within Doyle similar struggles with self-acceptance and personal redemption, Doyle's first allusion to his own past failures, we all got something to atone for, resonates with Angel's own feelings of guilt over his past as the ruthless and jealous. This creates a strong bond between the two characters who both understand the importance of continually working to be better people. And while Angel and Doyle do have a lot in common, that doesn't mean Doyle is a complete clone of him. Unlike Angel, Doyle is easygoing and genial. While both of them are reluctant to open up to the women they're interested in, Angel's primary fear is pragmatic, that he'll get too close to someone as he did with Buffy and lose his soul once again, while Doyle's worry is more grounded, fearing how the people close to him would react. Whatever you do, don't let her in on that me being half demon, okay? Because women get a little funny about that. For the audience, their relationship shows that if Angel, formerly the worst of the worst, can find the will to help others and save his own soul, so too can anyone who wishes to be better. Doyle shows that Angel can choose to not let the vampire side of him reflect all of who he is. This theme of the potential for change really extends to all the characters, and even to the city of LA itself. In Benjamin Jacobs' superb essay, Los Angeles, The City of Angel, he writes, All the series' settings — hotels, motels, brothels, hospitals, casinos, warehouses, sewers, fairgrounds — unless they become a final resting place, are locations of transition. No one belongs in Los Angeles. There is no home. There is no safe family. Initially, Gunn is literally homeless. Cordelia moved to LA to, unsuccessfully, fulfill her dream of stardom. Neither truly human nor vampire, Angel murdered his family and drifted across just about every continent before ending, or pausing, in LA. The Englishman Wesley had recently been fired from the council and thus effectively disowned by both his literal and metaphorical family. Fred is a long way from her Texan family. Lauren is in self-imposed exile from his home dimension. And in Season 5, the presence of Spike adds another geographically displaced English man. Around these characters, in bars and light-slashed clubs, those who have come to Los Angeles either to find something or escape something search for, as one demon says, make a connection. 
A major part of the thematic content of Season 1 is exploring how much Angel really has in common with the larger world. Angel is reflected in the people around him, both demons and humans. The episode The Bachelor Party is when we finally get some in-depth talk about his backstory. Doyle reunites with his estranged wife, Harry, soon to be ex-wife, as Harry has arrived with both a new man and divorce papers for Doyle to sign. Doyle falls into a spiral of angst and self-pity as we learn that he'd used to be a teacher and happily in love with Harry before he discovered his demon heritage, and supposedly becoming harder to be around as he tried and failed to deal with it. He claims at first that Harry couldn't accept his demon half, but after learning that her new partner is also part demon, he finally comes to the understanding that it was his own failure to accept himself that drove her away. You know, Harry didn't leave because of the demon in me. She left because of me. However, now that he has been on a new path along with Angel and Cordelia, a boy can take the noble route and give his blessing to the new marriage. In Nikki Stafford's book, Once Bitten, An Unofficial Guide to the World of Angel, she highlights the difference between Doyle's and Angel's human sides. Whereas Angel and Spike both have demons in them that have at one time clawed their way to the surface to take over their bodies, Doyle has always had control over his demons. He just didn't know it. When he fights, he refuses to let his demon face show because he's scared it'll make him more of a demon. Angel questions him about it, which is strange considering Angel also suppresses the demon within himself, although he shows it when it suits him in a fight. And there is a certain irony in Angel pushing Doyle to use his demon form more in fights, given his own fears over his. Makes it clear that he's not the only person in the world with the fears that he has. But even despite this difference, both of them come to understand that the duality of their existence can be used as a strength in their mission. By the end of this episode, Doyle's going full spiky face in a fight, not even out of a conscious effort, but as instinct, to help the people he cares for. Bro will still have a ways to go before he can open up to Cordelia about himself, but still, this shows a step in a good direction. Doyle! Oh, look what they did to you! So with such a terrific character who has such a great arc in so little time, what happened? Why was his time on the show so brief? Well, in order to answer that, we're gonna need to talk about some heavy stuff. By the time he had come onto the show, Glenn Quinn had already been struggling for years with alcoholism and drug use. The other actors and the creative leads have spoken about having not fully known how much he was struggling, though it did become apparent to those in charge as his problems started to negatively affect the production. David Greenwalt, the show's co-creator and showrunner for the first three seasons, said of him, I didn't know until later the full extent of Glenn's problems, but what I experienced on the show is he would have trouble remembering his lines. I don't recall him showing up late so much as screwing around on the set and laughing. I totally support actors laughing and talking right up until the call of action, except when they're laughing at their own performance and lack of professionalism. I took him into my little motorhome, we were in downtown LA, and let's say this was around episode 4 or 5. I said to him, look me in the eye. I'm a serial killer, you're going to die. You may not come to my set not knowing your lines. You may not come to my set and laugh over not knowing your lines. A lot of these people are driving a very long way here to work, and they have 18 hour days. They work very, very hard for a hell of a lot less money than you're making, and I will not stand for it. Do you understand me?" And he began to cry. Tim Minear, an executive producer and writer of most of the best episodes, would corroborate this explanation, saying, David Boreanaz really understood him and wanted him to get better, but when someone has a problem like drug addiction, there's really nothing you can do for them unless they decide they want to do something for themselves. I know this personally. And considering the show's use of vampirism and Angel's struggle with resisting the urge to drink human blood as a metaphor for alcoholism, it becomes sort of unfortunately ironic that the actor for the main character's right-hand man was struggling so hard with similar problems in his personal life. So, the creative leads made the decision to kill the character and let Glen Quinn go, leading us to what would be Doyle's final episode. 
The end of his time on the show actually starts one episode earlier, when Angel shows to us, the audience, the importance of sacrifice. After being made human for a day, Angel is finally able to live the life he's always wanted with Buffy. He gets a sample of an existence where his work is done, where he doesn't have to live with the guilt of his past actions, or the weight of his responsibility to others. So like, right afterward, he realizes that he has a part to play in the fight against an impending apocalypse, and understands that he can't do his part if he stays mortal, so he gives up being human because of course, of course, he can't just have one good thing, can he? Right after learning all this, Doyle begins to reckon with the full cost of what it means to give up personal comfort in the name of doing the right thing. Recognizing the gravity of this comes at an apt time, as the helpless are in need of some help, per usual, and this time around, Doyle has some personal stakes in the conflict. Thing is, is that a group of Brackens, Bracken being the demon race that Doyle heralds from, are seeking refuge from the Scourge, who are Nazis, fascists, and ne'er-do-wells. Doyle is given his own opportunity to reflect on its nature through the character of Reef, another Bracken who, like Doyle used to be, is ashamed of his lineage. Our dude is put in the position of consoling someone like him, someone who is younger, who has his whole life ahead of him, and tries to set him down the path he should have been on. Losing yourself somewhere, hoping it all goes away, I know that never works. How about we go find your family? During the evacuation effort, Angel realizes that the Scourge, those naughty rapscallions, have ignited a giant, giant doomsday device that will completely exterminate the Brackens. Well, shit. Angel's about to go out and disable the bomb, which would kill him in the process, but by this point, Doyle understands what he ought to do. What he thought he could never do at the start of the episode, and completely transforms the audience's perception of heroism. You never know until you've been tested. And both of these scenes are scored with one of the most beautiful pieces of music I've ever heard in a television show. At the time, the show's creative leads tried to keep Quinn's personal demons out of the press, and instead said that Doyle's death had been planned from the beginning as a way to show that anything could happen in the show's narrative. And while his death was controversial among some fans at the time, I think it does lend a ton of credibility to the show's willingness to take risks in its story arcs. Doyle's passing of his visions to Cordelia gave her more agency and direct responsibility within the show's stories, and the next episode saw the reintroduction of Wesley from Buffy Season 3, who would prove to become a fan-favorite character. Oh, rugged, handsome, and brains. Man, he's damn near perfect. Thank you. And as for Angel himself? Doyle's sacrifice represents a loss of a part of himself, both literally and metaphorically. Doyle was, at that point, the one person in Angel's life who could truly empathize with what he had been through. And they connected on a very personal level in their struggles with their pasts and a desire for redemption. But Doyle's death also represents a rebirth for Angel. He had been the first person to push Angel to prioritize not just saving lives, but actually connecting with people and saving souls. And after he learns that Angel had given up a chance at humanity in service of the good fight, so too does he. So Angel had, in a way, been able to save Doyle's soul. And I think it's that commitment to remain connected to humanity that motivates Angel to welcome Wesley into the team. Though he withdraws for a period and risks retreating into the disconnection he was stuck in before ever meeting Doyle, Angel eventually comes to instead live with what Doyle left behind for him, both the connection to the powers that be in Cordelia's visions and the continued pursuit of connection to humanity. And then over the next four years, everything goes to shit. The prophecies of Abergian. We don't want him dead. The vampire with a soul will become human. Right now, the three of us are all that's standing between you and real darkness. You're all fired. See the world 
doesn't work in spite of evil, Angel. It works with us. You had an epiphany, did you? If nothing we do matters, then all that matters is what we do. A child born to two vampires, born out of darkness to bring darkness. I, I, I don't think I've ever loved anything as much as this life that's inside of me. It's the one good thing we ever did together. Perhaps what you really seek is death. The pain that your heart begs for it. Love can be a terrible thing. I would take good care of them as though he were my own son. You thought you were doing the right thing. I hear that can be confusing. He hates you. They all do. And they're never gonna take you back. Nothing in the world is the way it ought to be. It's harsh. And cruel. But that's why there's us. Champions. Doesn't matter where we come from, what we've done, or suffered, or even if we make a difference. We live as though the world were as it should be, to show it what it can be. Season 5 sees yet another redefinition of the Angel Investigation's mission as they reluctantly accept an offer from Wolfram and Hart to take over the LA branch. They claim it's in the hope of using the company's plethora of resources to turn it into a weapon against evil, but there's always the pervading sense that after the banner year that was Season 4, the group has come to a rarely spoken about recognition that they ought to make some compromises as justification to continue doing what they do after what had basically amounted to ending world peace. That's not what happened. No? Jasmine was creating a slave state. Right. Where the slaves are full of giggly joy and love. Ugh, what a nightmare. But eventually, Angel, as well as everyone else in the group, has realized that the decision to come to Wolfram and Hart was a mistake. Fred, the most uncorrupted member of the group, has been killed, and the once all-powerful god Illyria has taken place in her body. Wesley, who had been in love with Fred, has fallen into depression and alcoholism over both her death and his past mistakes, as has Lorne. Gunn realizes that he'd inadvertently enabled the instrument of Fred's death to be released, and has lost much of his sense of self-worth. And Angel? He's become disconnected from everything he once cared about. He's lost sight of his mission to help people, lost his connections with his friends, and has lost all faith in the possibility of ever attaining true redemption or humanity. Essentially, he's once again become complacent about his place in the world, just in a heartbreakingly different way, and learns from an old enemy that that exact kind of complacency is what the forces of evil count upon to make the world worse. Every day you sit behind your desk and you, you learn a little more how to accept the world the way it is. Well, here's the rub. Heroes don't do that. Heroes don't accept the world the way it is. They fight it. All he has left is one final shot of making a statement about the inherent goodness of the fight against evil. In the terrific and heartbreaking episode, You're Welcome, Cordelia returns from death for one more chance to set Angel back on the right track. She passes on to him a vision that the group, and we the audience, find out in the penultimate episode is of the senior partner's players on Earth. Circle of the Black Thorn. Angel decides that all bets are off. He reveals to the group that he intends to enact a swift suicide strike against the Black Thorn to hopefully throw a wrench into the senior partner's gears, and send a message that humanity will never go down without a fight. We can't bring down the senior partners, but for one bright, shiny moment, we can show them that they don't own us. I'll never forget how shocked and impressed I was the first time I watched the scene where he extends his invitation to the group to join him. While each of these characters have lost so much and both done and suffered so much harm, 
they each have their own very good reason to join Angel on this mission. And as one by one, everyone in the team raises their hand, choosing to give everything they have, including possibly their lives, in the fight, what do we hear? I'm in. Within the scope of what I've been analyzing here, the fates of the characters that even make it to the final episode aren't as relevant. For some, this is their last battle. For others, it's only their next battle. But they all resolve to continue the fight to their respective ends anyway, because they know that humanity is worth fighting for. And in those final moments, as the few remaining characters left stare down their most impossible odds yet, I'm reminded of Doyle saying, when the chips are down, and you're at the end of your rope, you need someone that you can count on. And that's what you'll find here. Someone who'll go all the way, who'll protect you no matter what. So don't lose hope. Doyle is the prototype for the show's thesis. That the true value of redemption comes from the work you do to earn it. To make the most selfless decisions, at the most dire times, in service of the unwinnable battle for humanity. <clears throat> Is that it? Am I done? <laughs> <laughs>